Welcome to Right to the Core, a 17 minute a day practice with Marilyn Her- Horowitz. Sorry, started to pr- pronounce that wrong. <laughs> Today we're going to, we were already doing our welcome and we're going to introductions in a moment. Then we're going to go into our discussion with Marilyn with some mm-hmm. questions from Celtics ourselves, just asking her to talk about the topic. Um, and then we're going to go into those pre-submitted questions. So the community questions. And then at the end, we have our closing remarks. And we're going to let you know about a door prize that we have for the webinar. Before we get started with that, I did want to let you know about what Celtics has planned for the year. Um, very shortly, we're going to be releasing an update to our framework for our, web- for our website. Um, it's a newer, more intuitive way to navigate your project's documents. We're also, along with that, going to have improved sharing and permission controls. We're looking to just up the ante on performance time, less load times. If you're interested in game VR scripting, we have a really amazing new experience coming for that. Um, That's going to be a little later in the year. And this is the first in our new webinar series in which we're going to follow the process of creating from ideation right up to I'm ready to release the film. So keep an eye on your inboxes in the months to come for the invitations to our future webinars. We'll be holding one each month. So in order to get started, um, I'm Dara. Those of you who have joined our webinars before are used to myself and Nicole. We're always the host and co-host in the Celtics webinars. I usually handle the beginning of the webinars and Nicole handles the community discussion. Nicole's also done some webinars completely on her own, which is just a Wonder Woman thing to do. Um, We also have Chelsea and Laura. You'll be talking to them in the chat. Chelsea just recently um, introduced herself in the chat there and Laura is going to be monitoring the Q&A. So she'll be the one looking at your questions there. And then of course, we have Marilyn. Marilyn is our guest today, and she's going to be talking to us about her upcoming book and the practice of her 17-minute-a-day practice. Um, So I'm just going to stop sharing. And uh, for those of you who want to read that bio, it was included in our, um, our email that we sent out as well, as well as on our registration page. And just to get started, Marilyn, we have a we just showed everyone a bio, but could you tell us a little bit about yourself? You're an award-winning film professor, a TV show creator, a producer, an author, a writing coach, and I'm sure there's much more. A lovely person, as I've come to know over the past <laughs> couple of weeks. Can you tell us a little more about yourself and how you got started on all of these similar but at the same time different paths? Well, I was very, I was very fortunate. Um, I, I come from a sort of a, a Woody Allen type family in New York, and you know, my family were were, were entertainment lawyers and, and bankers, and the idea that anybody who did anything creative was horrifying to them. You know, they can, they can. You know, my grandfather was back in the, in the '30s, and back in those days, directors were the help. Right. You know, actors were the help. I mean, you know, that they, they it, it's just a completely different mindset. <laughs> So the fact that I wanted to be part of the help got me into, you know, the usual creative stuff. Um, uh, so I, um, but I was, I was a fine artist and um, I got, I got, because of, of my grades and stuff, I got a, 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 a scholarship to NYU, but in the painting department, I was like, oh great, I'm going to be a fine artist. I'll be the next Helen Nussbaum or something. But then I discovered that what they taught was how to teach children. Oh. And, um, you know, I, I'm a very anti-authority person and it, it would have not been a fit. So I basically called up and said, well, what else do you have? <laughs> and they said, oh, yeah, we're starting this thing called the film department. This is a few years ago. And so I was like, film, that's my family's business. That's easy. That's like learning how to roll carpet, you know, no problem. <laughs> so, um, so I was able to, to get in because my father was in the business and he knew the head of the thing. And so I got in and I was like the first woman there to, to make a movie. Um, so I was in production. I wasn't in writing. I was, I was a filmmaker. So I made a, a movie that was sold to Showtime. Um, and uh, and it, was, it was very fun. But I discovered that I didn't like production because I don't like getting up early. So that, that, was, that was a short <laughs> a lot <career>. of that. <laughs> um, And then it basically 
what, you know, the way things go in your life is you never know what's going to happen. And somehow my production experience, because then I worked as a producer of commercials and so on and so forth, um, you know, roll forward tape. I get hired at NYU grad, which is, you know, pretty fancy film school um, that I probably couldn't have gotten into back in the day, but I'm now I'm hired to teach. Um, and so, you know, I taught there for six or seven years. But what I taught, and this is the fun part, is I taught directors how to write stuff that they could actually direct as opposed to, you know, being in the dramatic writing department. So one of the things that I, I that is unique about me is this ability to understand what the difference, what it's actually going to look like when you, when you take it off the page and put it on the screen. And that's something that I think people really need to become aware of and that whole idea of, you know, what is visual writing? And one of the things I particularly loved about cell text, not to give you a free plug, but I really love this, uh, is the fact that you can use the cards either way. You can use the cards as storyboards. And I just thought that was, I've never seen that anywhere. And I just, I'm going to start using that. I think it's fantastic. You know, that is so innovative that you have this possibility of, you know, sequences, scenes, and then to use the same tool for, uh, to actually make storyboards without having to go to the trouble of, of the images. So I love it. <laughs> so anyway, so what happened to me was just one of those things. And, and from the moment I started teaching, uh, people came up to me and said, can you fix my screenplay? So it was one of those things where I hate authority. Um, uh, I, I was very reluctant to teach. Um, wasn't particularly thrilled about the whole thing. Um, but my friend was pregnant, so I really kind of had to jump in for her. <laughs> and then within, within a year, I had a full practice. Uh, within a year of teaching had already become my hobby. Mm. And my actual job was as a writing coach. And you know, so, you know again, I, I don't want to toot my own horn much here, but let's just say that a lot of Emmys, lots of Peabody's, lots of writers produced by major publishing houses, um, blah, blah. It worked out pretty good. Um, the reason this all happened, uh, 25 words, was because I wrote a novel when I was about 30 um, I went to a party and some guy, I was a single then, some guy said, hey, baby, you know, my best friend's a movie producer. I'm like, yeah, right. But he was. <laughs> and he optioned my unpublished manuscript, which was about a serial killer and his sister. And I was hired to now adapt my own screenplay. So I'd gone to film school. I knew what I was doing, right? Mm -hmm. Remember, the punchline is I didn't work in writing. I worked in the production department. <laughs> right. <laughs> and so I had to learn how to write a screenplay. And after 30 drafts, I had transformed what was a how done it. You know, you go back and forth and you see, what, you know, one people into a who done it where you didn't see the bad guys to the last third of the movie. So I had an education, you know, in blood. <laughs> and, uh, and, and he was a very difficult man. And the night before I was, I was going to get, I was handing it in. He called me and he said, this really sucks. And I'm hiring another writer. And I went, oh, my God. So I confess, I had a couple glasses of wine, fell asleep. <laughs> and I dreamt that Joseph Campbell, you know, the great mythologist, he did this book. All, everybody out there, the power of myth, comparative storytelling, look into it. Don't read his books. They're unreadable. But watch the power of myth series. It's from the 80s. It's Bill Moyers. It's fantastic. Uh, he came to me in my dream and he said, okay, and he's up a tree wearing a toga. And he said, I'm, I'm just being a metaphor for where you are. And I do lucid dream, I have to say. And he said, you know, what do you need? And I said, well, what do I do worse than writing? And I thought, ah, I can't read a map. I said, great, give me a map. That'll help. And so I woke up and it's in, this is all in my yellow book. And I wrote down these 12 circles. And when I went and examined what I've been given by the creator, was a simplified version of his hero's journey. In other words, it was 12 steps instead of 17 steps and they kind of were in English. So they made sense. They weren't mythical, they were very practical. And so somehow people got wind of this and I started teaching this thing and people, you know, just, you know, the, the, the ability to create story and, and be prolific just completely changed. And I realized that I'd been given a better mousetrap. Um, the end of my story was that Thanks to my dream, I was able to wrap up the script in such a way that he had to pay me. <laughs> Excellent. So, <laughs> I was really, 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 really pleased about that. So anyway, so that's my story. And then, you know, as I say, sometimes, you know, the things that you're, you're meant to do find you. And as I said, just somehow, you know, a year after I was asked to teach, I had a full practice. I had no time to teach. I was really mostly a coach. And um, I, I have, and I've, I've been doing this for almost 25 years. So I have worked with thousands of people in this fantastically intimate way because 
you get to know them as well as a therapist, but you're, you're producing a piece of work. You're not trying to make them happy or anything. It's just so much better for me. <laughs> so does that answer your question? Probably overkill. No, that's perfect. And I, I, it's amazing the similarities between your story and some other guests we've had in the past of just that, that one moment where everything just kind of clicked for them and they went on a new, almost a new journey, although it was just fixing the journey they were on, really. Um, so I find that fascinating. You know, it's, uh, it's, it's really interesting. So, so just uh, to put this in context, I'm sorry, Dara, just so we... No, go ahead. This, this is my new direction. In other words, I, you know, I, I did this, I wrote a novel. I have this uh, comedy website called JoeGotTastick.com, which I do animated cartoons with, with, yeah. with, with, a, with a partner. Um, and that was, that's really fun. When we're now trying to figure out a way to sort of turn it into a robot chicken kind of idea. But meanwhile, you know, this new direction during the pandemic, I made this, all these scripting techniques up for my students gave about six or seven webinars for free just to keep people in good mood. Mm -hmm. And it took off and here I am. So it's a new direction. Exactly. Exactly. There's always branching paths that just take you to ultimate great destinations. I find one of really great. Um, so you mentioned your books and you do have an upcoming book on scripting for writers, which is part of what we're here talking about today. Um, I had the privilege of attending one of Marilyn's webinars, not attending, sorry, viewing a recording of one of Marilyn's webinars and um, seeing her daily five part practice that aims to help writers get more comfortable with themselves and their writing practice. And, and really your feeling about writing. I had to share a little success story of my own after viewing the recording. I've been working on a book of poetry and there's been one poem that's really been stumping me. And I used Marilyn's practice and last night I was able to rewrite that poem and I just feel incredibly happy about it right now. Oh, great. So, um, so for everyone out there who's about to learn this, you know, I really encourage you to use it. Like just don't, don't take it and file it away. Wake up tomorrow morning and start doing it because I think you'll see a difference in some of the work that you're doing. Um, <clears throat> so <laughs> Can you explain for our audience, Marilyn, how this process works? And I know you did want me to share a slide for that. So I'll get that queued up now, but you can go ahead and get Thank started you. introducing it. Okay, well, the, the basic idea is that um, uh, a, lot of the, a lot of the problems that people have as writers is getting started, not procrastinating. A lot of the questions, this will all be answered by use scripting. Um, because I'm a professional coach and because I'm working with people who are usually very busy and have to do things um, uh, quickly, I had to find a way to get people to be uh, consistently productive. And um, what that means to me is that you, you, know, you make a distinction if you wanna look at this way that your brain is kind of your everyday thing that you use to get you out of bed, to get you to class and, and, and to work and whatever. But then we try to use that part of ourselves to be creative, and that's a mistake. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so the scripting techniques allow you in literally one, one movement of your pen to flip out of your brain into what I'm going to call your mind space. And the mind space is a clear space where you can receive information and you're, you're not, for however short or long a time, you're not dealing with the everyday to day stuff that your brain is dealing with. So you're free because in this mind space, there are no limits. Okay, that's the basic way of talking about this. So uh, what we in practice, you know, I did the webinars and people were willing to be my guinea pigs because it was a free webinar. Mm -hmm. And what we discovered was that if you put in 10 minutes in the morning and about five to seven minutes at night, something really happened and it was permanent. And if you keep doing it, you're gonna see amazing results. So I'm gonna step up uh, and take one step back for a second and explain mm -hmm. that this <clears throat> better mousetrap that I invented was the result of being tortured by this movie producer in Hollywood. <laughs> and, uh, and once I got off the rack, I thought, no, I'm going to find a way to create a re repeatable process where you can make up a good story you can use structure to tie that story to a plot. That's a whole longer conversation with plot and story. And that you can do this over and over again. So then what the writer is left with is worrying about whether or not the piece is any good. 
right. rather than all the, the, the low level stuff that's I call brain stuff, you know, format, words. We want to get into that mind space where we're really trying to tell an original story and tune into, you know, the deeper part of ourselves, which often has no words, which is why we can access it through one word. Mm. Right. Because, because, because the, th that part of our brain doesn't, doesn't have the, the left brain has the math, the sentences, the structure, the right brain has images. So we discovered that if you use one word, it, it sets off the right brain and gets you feeling, and then you can flip over. And this particular style that you can see here of working in a circular fashion moves the brain chemicals, the dopamine and the serotonin, so that you access these other part of the brain that you can't do other ways. So this is very technical underneath all of this non-technical stuff. So my invitation is that since people here are, are, are writers, aspiring writers, let's try writing, okay? And can you check and see in the chat and see if everybody's willing to grab a piece of paper and grab a pen yeah, and, and do a couple minutes work? So if everyone has a pen and piece of paper with them or a desktop. If they have a tablet that they can make a circle on, that's it. fine too. Anything like that. I should have let people know before the webinar to bring a pen and paper, but. Um, um, your, your, your palm will do. <laughs> yes, exactly. You can just do a, envision it. <laughs> there you go. All right. It looks like, or the table. Okay, what are we getting? Exactly. Good. People can do it. It looks like people are ready. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Good. If I take my eyes in the chat, I'll lose my train of thought. That's why I'm not. Yes, I okay. totally get it. <laughs> All right. So fellow writers, do this. Take your piece of paper and draw a circle in the center of your paper. Can I, can I use my pointer? Can you see it? Uh, no, we won't can see you it. Use I your pointer and, and, and make it go around the circle here. That's the one. Stop there. And then where it says writing, underscore that, please, Dara, yeah. put in the first word that comes to your mind. Dara, why don't you be our guinea pig? What is the first word that comes into your mind? Uh, mermaid. <laughs> okay, play along with me because you're a poet. You're my perfect victim here. All right. So take your piece of paper and write victim. Everybody got a word, maybe one that they were surprising. And if it's dirty, that's fine. Just don't share, okay? <laughs> um, now what you're going to do is I'm going to tell you what to do. And then Dara is going to somehow, no, uh, can, can Laura or someone else time it so Dara can actually do the exercise because I'm going to use her as my guinea pig. So now what you're gonna do is take that word, mermaid, and you see how the circles are here? There are two ways to do this. The way I do it is I write something that, that is a free association, then I circle it, and then I attach it. Right. Okay, Derek, can you use your cursor to show that? Yep. Okay, so, so that's, so, so I write it, then I put the circle, and then I attach it. All right. Others, other people I work with like to put the circles around first and attach them and then fill them in. And then other people like to, 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 to make the line, the circle, and then write in there. So it just whatever works for you. But for now, try it my way, which is you write whatever it is, you put a circle around it, and you attach it. Okay. So what we'd like to do is we'd like to go, we talked, I think we talked about maybe doing a minute. Yes. And the idea is to come up with as many words and phrases. The key is not to try to control it. What I'm trying to explain is that we must write without restraint. We have to just recover that ability to just go. And that's what's gonna change our, our writing practice when we're working on a specific piece. So ready, steady, someone time um, Dara for a minute and let me know when we're done. I got my timer started too, but. Mm. So just free associate, and if, if the, the better, the less your free association has to do with the word you pick, the better. I mean, we're, we're trying to find something that you couldn't find any other way.
Nope, there we go. Timer is up. Okay, done, right? Yes. All right, so, so Jared, do, do you mind sharing your works? Yeah, I, I can't hold it up because I did it on my phone, but my words are, uh, so my first word was mermaid, um, obviously ocean, you know, that one. <laughs> yeah, don't, don't editorial, that's, okay. May yes, I, I won't editorialize. Okay. I love you for doing this. This is the first <laughs> thing that we writers must stop doing. Is editorializing. Don't yeah. judge, just do. Okay. Go. So, so I have mermaid, then ocean, myth, tears, truth, loneliness, search for home, rocks, and guttural tides. Beautiful. So as a poet, I'm going to go right for the guttural tides. Mm. Fantastic <laughs> image. And it's funny because the word mermaid popped in my mind because that's another poem I'm working on that has a Well, that, that part figure. is not so surprising, but maybe the guttural tides. The is guttural the, tides. That I is, think. that's, you can't make, you, you can't think that stuff up. That is, that yeah. it's so evocative. It's like T.S. Eliot, you know, and the, the sound of the hollow men. I mean, it's just yes. guttural tides. Okay, but now just to, to make the point here. So if Dara were working on a screenplay, okay, she, she's, she's a poet, so she's working on, um, she's working on getting beautiful phrases that, that completely summarize. To me, guttural tides gives me the chills because I totally, you know, I see twilight, I see, uh, you know, angry, uh, uh, you know, rocks being crashed against it. It's just very evocative. But in a screenplay, you might be looking for something in a scene where someone has to tell someone something and they need to tell them indirectly. You know, the guy's at dinner with the girl and he goes, you know, you're like a mermaid, you know, you're so lovely. Mm. You know, but I sense this guttural tide within you. There's something dark. And, and suddenly you see how we have a very interesting scene using your words in that way. Yeah. Another way you would use this would be, okay, I, I was stuck on location. All right. Exterior, beach, twilight, stormy water. Hmm. Right? Yeah. Right. Lily, who looks like a mermaid in her green pants and, and, and green top, you know, walks with Liam, you know, a, you know, an angry rock star. I mean, you don't know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, it's awesome. <laughs> but, but, but you see how just from that tiny giving yourself, uh, this is for all of us writers, we have to learn this, we must learn, write this down somewhere. My, your goal must be two things. One, accept yourself, which, which Dara doesn't, okay? Learn to get out of your own way. If you don't accept yourself, no one else will. If you don't think you're good, no one else will. It's really that simple, but you have to believe it. You can't say affirmations and do that stuff. You have to find a way to accept yourself warts and all, you know, it's very hard, but that's, a, that's the big job. The second job is to look for that moment of freedom where you just go, ah! And you had that, right, Dara, for a minute there, you were just like, I went. Yeah, <laughs> the guttural tides was definitely. Guttural tides is fantastic, but the point is, fellow writers, this is not taught. This writing without restraint is not taught, and it's scary because this is where, when you were a little kid, when you had dreams and you told people, your parents laughed at you and your friends laughed at you. So you are, to, to do even this little piece of work with me is an act of incredible bravery because we are all ridiculed for being original because we have a different job when we're little, we have to fit in and make sure society works, right? But you know, to doing the scripting, I, I'm sure everybody saw The Matrix, right? Remember the original movie, The Matrix? And it's like, yeah. you know, if you want to stay in, in dreamland, take the blue pill. If you want to get into what's real, take the red pill. Scripting is the red pill. Boom. You go right into <clears throat> what is your true creative space. So, you know, this is, this is, a, this is not a woo-woo fun. This is, this is a way of actually becoming a, finding your, being able to express yourself truly. Okay. And I'm sorry, I don't want to proselytize, but this is powerful yeah. stuff as you just, as we all just witnessed with Derek. And the fact that the small piece that Dara did could lend itself to three or four different excellent creative scenes. And even you could extrapolate that into a movie. You know, it, it's about a guy who thinks he saw a mermaid. And, you know, it turns out he has bad eyesight and she was wearing her green outfit. <laughs> yeah. 
That's perfect. Okay. Yeah. Good. So, so now we know why word of the day is so good. Do you want me to go on to the next one? Is how's our time? Um, I think we can take. Well, yeah, we can take another. Yes, let's go on to the next one. Now, I didn't. Uh, I wasn't sure if how to put them in the slides. So we'll just get you to explain how the next one works. Okay. So, so basically that, that in your morning practice, if you took it on, that would probably be about five minutes. The next part would be to write about it. In other words, you, 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 you allow yourself to come up with the first word that comes here and you can tell which if it comes right out of you, you grab it, you cluster for a minute. You can use your, your phone. I recommend it. And then you give yourself another minute or two and you write about what you've done. So what I so my riffing after Dara did the exercise would be what you would do on paper, and even if it seemed to have nothing to do with the project you're working on, assume that your creative mind is trying to help you move forward. So you saw how I took Dara's words and I related them to a poem, I related them to a screenplay, I related them to a TV show. Okay, so that's so for whatever medium you're working in, you do that. Next, put that aside. That you're going to do three things in this order. You're going to write down five to seven things that you want. And again, the, 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 well, the difference here is not, this is not the usual junk. This is from that creative space where you found that word, find the wants. They're usually not things that you expect. I mean, obviously, yeah, we all want certain things, but you may find that, you know, you really want to find that orange sweater that you left in the laundry last week. <laughs> and you don't know why. And this is the other part of it. You have to follow this part of you in this short time. So then when you do wants, let's say your wants are, uh, you know, um, I want to, I want to eat healthy today. Uh, I want to go to the gym. I want to pick up the laundry. Um, I don't want to get into a fight with my significant other. And uh, I'm going to teach my cat or dog a new trick. That's about what you can come up with five things. And of course, writing, I'm going to write two pages or whatever. And then you go to beliefs. Now, beliefs are, you know, again, we're talking about how to accept yourself and find a way to, to be in a better relationship with yourself so you can be in a better relationship with your writing. This is where the belief work comes in because what you believe influences how you perceive everything that occurs. It doesn't, it doesn't mean that you're changing reality. It means that your perception. So um, I'll tell you a very quick story, Dara. When I, uh, I had to hire an editor to work on my first book, which is called The Book of Zev. It's a thriller. And I interviewed about 50 editors and I had, and I was at a writer's conference. I had coffee with this guy who was a PhD in philosophy uh, who taught ethics. And I said, okay, I forget his name. I said, okay. So, you know, uh, uh, you know, like astonish me, you know, uh, uh, give me your pitch. And he said, uh, what I've discovered in, in, in modern literature is that there are only two, there's only, there's only one thing that the writer ever has to decide. I said, Oh, what is that? And he says, does the writer believe in an avenging or a beneficial God? Mm. And I went, whoa, okay, because that's what my book's about. So I was like, okay. But if we extrapolate that, once you start to write down your wants versus your beliefs, and you start being in that space where you start to feel the conflicts, you can ask yourself these questions. So the way that you see the larger power or not influences very directly what occurs for you because it's what you're willing to allow to happen, right? If you don't believe in miracles, I guarantee you there won't be any. Yeah. Right? What, what is it? If you argue for your limitations, you always get them. No, it's not the <laughs> so the beliefs are, I believe I can write this long form piece. Um, uh, I, you know, uh, I believe that I can do this and keep my job. I, I believe I can teach my dog a new trick. <laughs> Something on that level. Then you go to the last part, which is the the the, the, right, the daily script. Now, the daily script is actually part of the second part, even though you do it in the morning. So the purpose of the first part is to deal with the big issues, which I saw as questions that writers suffer from. Remember, I've been a coach for 25 years. How do you know you're a writer? How do you know you did any work? How do you know how much work you need to do to feel okay about being a writer? Well, here's, I've tricked you, okay? Because it's, now that you've done the word of the day, you're done, you wrote, you can't have writer's block. Too late. So what you've got is to understand is that you don't know what you want to write. So now you know that your job. So in your daily script, you put, ah, I need to know about tidal pools. I need to know about mermaids. I need to know about blah, blah, blah. So, right. But the daily script is intended for you as a writer to organize your day 
as you would like it to be. In other words, you need to say, well, you know, in my perfect day, uh, I got up, I worked for two hours, and then I did everything else, right? Or, or whatever you want to do, or I'm, I'm going to write for you know, 10 minutes between you know, meetings or whatever. But the idea is you use that time to plan your writing and plan other things that are important to you. And then that's it. That's the whole 10 minutes in the morning. And then in the evening, hopefully just about when you're going to bed, you take a new page and you write nightly scripts and you compare with what you wanted to happen at the end of your morning script with what actually happens. And there are lots of ways to do that. For me, I'm interested in, in results. So I don't care if I spend an hour. If this, if this is something that comes up, I'll just share. I try to write, when, I, when I'm actually writing, I try to write five pages a day. When I'm revising, I try to do at least 15 pages a day. And I don't care if it takes me 10 minutes or 12 hours because I have the luxury of, of, of having it work for me either way. If you ha don't have that luxury, you have to be a little more focused. But the point is you have to decide every day what your quote is going to be. Now, I'm going to recommend, since we're talking about this, at night, that you start by doing this with your daily script saying, I did my scripting in the morning because you've already done that. And then when you go to bed, you've already done that. And that becomes your barometer. You give yourself two weeks to start to see how you change as a writer when you're not beating yourself up for everything you're not doing every day. So this is one of the powers of this scripting technique is that once you commit to this being the baseline of your writing, then so much pressure leaves. People become so much more productive. Mm -hmm. And if you have writer's block, just we'll answer it in more depth. Writer's block is not what it appears. Writer's block is because you're a sensible person. You know how hard writing is and you don't want to write about something when you're not sure what you're writing about. So to me, the cure for writer's block is research. And not beating yourself up. I know this is a recurrent theme, which is, okay, I'm, I'm not stupid. I'm smart. I don't want to write something if I don't know what I'm writing. Okay, let me go figure out what I, what I don't know. Right. That's a, that's a good insight there, for sure. Um, I think I'm just taking a look at the time. And I know we have a lot of questions from our participants. So I did have some other questions I was going to ask you, Marilyn. But I feel like our participants are going to get more value from this if we just go into their questions at this stage. So on that note, I'm going to get Nicole to um, start presenting those questions and asking you those. Um, Nicole is right there and ready. So I'm just okay. going to turn off hey, my hey, video. Hey, and Nicole's going to go before we go, Dara. Yeah. Okay. Uh, big group. Let's give Dara a hand because that was incredibly brave. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> really, that's that was that was brave. Thank you for for stepping up and just you know allowing people to really see how to do it. Well done. Thanks. Dara is pretty amazing. I, oh, I have to agree. <laughs> um, thank you so much, Dara, and thanks, Marilyn, for that amazing walkthrough of some of your processes. Uh, personally, I'm so inspired, and I hope. Our participants are finding it as insightful um, as I am. Uh, so thank you so much. Uh, so to get started with our community questions, we actually had over 200 pre-submitted questions, uh, which is incredible. Um, so I wanted to take a moment to say thank you so much to our participants and our registrants for being so engaged by this topic. Um, and without further ado, I'm gonna jump right in because we have a lot of questions to ask you, Marilyn. Um, so first up, uh, our, um, one of our participants, Anthony, has asked, uh, whenever uh, they sit down to write, they find themselves having to spend the first 20 or 30 minutes uh, reading and reviewing what they wrote uh, the previous day to get themselves um, in the proper headspace. Uh, does this resonate with you, Marilyn? And uh, if so, do you have any tips on speeding up that process so that they can get uh, to actual writing quicker? Uh, well, this goes back to what's become a thematic uh, thing about the seminar, which is that this is this is this is an insecurity issue. In other words, if you go and you look up a lot of writers, many, many writers reread their work in the morning, like Hemingway and you know, really famous writers. 
Um, the problem here is, is your uncertainty. In other words, this is, this is your process. You need to do this. You need to take the half hour. And who told you that that's a short or a long amount of time? This is where we, we start to get into the real work here. In other words, this is what I mean about the conditioning and about how we, you know, a half hour is actually very short. It's fine. So I think that it's a great process and I think you should do it every day. But I do think that you want to begin by using the scripting techniques because they tend to shorten your need. So you do, you know, the 10 minutes of scripting. And then when you go to read yesterday's work, you, you've made that connection, as I said, to this other creative space. So you're going to be able to read yesterday's work freshly, which will help you revise better. That's great. Yeah, I, I also find that I need to refresh myself on anything that I write um, in order to get it going. But yeah, uh, along with the process that we just saw uh, in action, I think that's a really good combo. Um, okay, so next question is from Victoria. Uh, they ask, how do you write good or believable dialogue between characters without sounding like uh, they're kind of fake or only giving exposition. Okay, that is a whole seminar, but here's a short answer. <laughs> so Victoria, the first part is to understand why people speak in real life. They speak when they want something. So if you wanna be very focused, a scene begins when one character asks for something and it ends when they get it or not. And this is true of scenes with multiple characters as well. That's part one. Part two, um, the seminar that I'm giving tonight on voice is relevant, okay? It's very important to hear your character's voices. And every character has a unique background. They use words that were in their family. They use expressions from their time, their references to TV shows. So part of it is if you're writing something that you know, just make a list of the cultural references at that time. Um, if there are people you don't know, do a little research. It's usually like a time capsule or something. Um, and then the most important thing, I think, uh, is to find an actor or actress who sounds like your character. Again, this is just a, a you know, this is just a, like a, it's like training wheels. I mean, you're not going to copy them. But um, I was working on a piece uh, the other day and I, with, with, a, with a student, and they just absolutely could not, you know, the dialogue was just flat, expositional, was doing and I said, you know, and it was, it, was, it, was, it was a villainous character. I said, whose voice do you hate? And he said, I hate Joe Pesci's voice. And so we went and we listened to some Joe Pesci, you know, a little bit from Goodfellas, a little bit from The Super, a little bit from those movies. And I could see my, my character just, you know, my, hair, my student. And that was it. And, and, and then when, when the dialogue came back, it's not that he copied or anything. It's just that... You know, you could almost, he, he, you know, he put in the parenthetical whining. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like he went for it. So, again, everything, everything, because so the reason I mentioned my, my production background is that everything that you're writing is a blueprint to become a piece of dramatic literature. So that's where you can use that to, to help you. So recap. People only talk when they want something and the scene ends when they get or don't get it. I love that. I love being able to visualize who you imagine saying a, a particular dialogue and, and allowing that kind of visualization to, yeah, to help you. Yeah, you do you know? <laughs> I love that. Uh, take it one step further and, and knit your own sock puppets for your hands. I love that. Um, but to... Uh, what you had mentioned um, in that response. Uh, I absolutely recommend uh, that anybody interested attend Marilyn's second webinar of the day <laughs> tonight. Um, and we'll be sending out an email after this webinar uh, with some details that might help you register for that. So uh, keep your eyes peeled to your inbox. Um, thank you so much, Marilyn. That was uh, super insightful. I love it. Um, I'm going to I'm going to try bringing some of that visualization into my writing as well. All right. Third question is uh, from Don. Um, and Don asks, what is the best approach for quickly writing a screenplay? Uh, start with storyboarding. Um, and this kind of follows up on, on why you were talking about storyboarding uh, at the beginning of the webinar. Uh, no, I, I, I honestly, you know, my, my, what, I, what I teach is, is a book called How to Write a Screenplay in 10 Weeks. 
And my, my better mousetrap is a way to, um, to do this very quickly, John. And the basic concept is no, you start with your character and you use the four magic questions to find out what their needs are and what they want. And then you set up your story based on, you know, looking at the three act structure in four pieces. So you ask what the character's dream is, what their nightmare is, what would they die for, and do they get their dream or not? And you use that as a basis. So, and then um, the way that my, my book is set up is this is the fastest way, honestly, that I can, I have, I'm not, you know, you just sit down for two hours and you draw and you answer questions to each character takes 15 minutes to do a, you know, a character bio. And then you're going to start to see <clears throat> which way your story has to go. And again, this discussion of, of story and plot, you know, we're, we're, we're taught much too quickly to, to try to create a plot and then jam the story into it. You know, it's important to, 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 to again, we're going to go to this at a certain point, but for me, the way that I teach this is I say, look, okay, so you're developing a screenplay and you've got to do it fast because that's what I do for a living, right? Okay, here, cut through everything, use my writing system, get the four magic questions, the 12 million, but here, here's the big deal. What does your character want? Okay, and whatever your character wants is not what they need. So, for example, in The Godfather, Michael wants to be independent and not part of the family but he needs his father's approval. So if you look at that story that way, doesn't that make sense, right? So right in The Wizard of Oz, Dorothy thinks that she has to be a good niece. She wants to be a good niece, she wants to fit in, but what she needs to do is be a hero and find hope. And that's the way you start with the story. And you, the writer, know what the character actually needs, but the, the character cannot. I love it. Uh, Don, I hope you found that useful. Um, yeah, I, I think differentiating between the wants and the needs can be tricky sometimes, uh, especially when you're in the writing process, but an important one to help drive your story for sure. Thank you. Okay, so next question is from Dylan. Uh, Dylan asks, um, upon finishing a first draft, how long should one wait before attempting a rewrite? Uh, is it helpful to work on other projects during this time? Well, some of that is personality. There, there are different kinds of writers and, and you have to answer the question for yourself. My personal experience for myself is no. And I, I, the way that I teach rewriting, I'm teaching a class right now, is that when you finish the script, you can rest it for a little while, you know, a couple of weeks or whatever. But then, and this is the really disgusting part, you have to print out a hard copy and you have to read all the way through it. <laughs> and, and you have to, and you can, you're allowed to make notes, but you're not allowed to go onto your computer and start changing stuff. Because when you, when you all writing is rewriting, the first draft is a, is, a, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a waking dream, if you use my method, because that's the whole thing about using these creativity. You're not doing it in the math side. You're not you know, pushing your, your story around like chess pieces. You're actually creating it out of your head and things are, are happening. Not that you don't need to use the structure. So the first thing you do is you have to take stock of what you actually have before you start changing it. That's, about, that's harder than anything else. And then once you're done, um, you know, people always ask, you know, should you have an outline? Should you not have an outline? If you can, it's helpful. But if you don't, make it up as you go. And then after you're finished with the script, you have to sit with the outline, read the script, and then you have to do that work there at some point. But you have to find a way to look at the structure separate from the... Uh, but the most important thing is not to do this with your mind. In other words, if you do a math version of the screenplay, it's basically like a stillborn baby. You just can't resuscitate it. It will never be alive. And that's you'll spend really... the next two years, you know, trying to, trying to thread your characters through it. I'm sorry. Oh, no, sorry. I, I didn't mean to interrupt. Um, but I find that point really interesting. And I think it has, um, or it's relatable, actually, to a question that just came in uh, through the chat um, from uh, one of our uh, attendees, Jackie. Um, 
you know, your thoughts on using beats for, for writing scripts, do you think that that is kind of too formulaic or, or do you think it's useful? Um, well, you know, again, whenever people ask me questions like this, the answer to all these questions is always when. <clears throat> right, like, like when do you need beats? When, you know, now I don't know, there, there are different kinds of beat sheets. If you're talking about the Save the Cat kind of beat board or whatever, um, as I say, my experience um, having been a teacher for a long time and a writer is I think that people have this fantasy and teachers support it that somehow this is a math exercise. And that if you, you know, if you, if you follow the, the steps and so on and so forth, you'll, you'll get your screenplay. And the answer is no, you won't because a story is like a DNA strand, right? Without with the, without the character's story, the plot is irrelevant and no one will care about it. So really the way to look at a story is I would like to do a story about, um, I wanna do a police thriller set in Newfoundland. And I wanna, I wanna do an homage to my brother. Um, and he was a very smart guy, so I'm gonna make him into a cop. Um, but you know, in his life, um, he always stopped short of the mark. And so he ended up with a couple of divorces and, you know, he wasn't the best father and so on and so forth. So in my story, I'm going to have that character be sort of that deadbeat kind of guy, but something's going to happen that transforms him and makes him step up or not. And if he doesn't step up, it's a tragedy. If he does step up, it's, it's, it's a heroic story. And then if he, ha if he has all kinds of, you know, uh, problems, it can be either a comedy or a drama. But you see how we did that in like less than a minute? I love it. <laughs> really insightful. Thank you. Jackie, I, I know that you're here, so I hope you found that uh, as useful and insightful as I did. Oh, this is so awesome. Marilyn, thank you so much. Happy to. Um, <laughs> uh, yes, yeah, so on to the next question. Um, inevitably, there was always meant to be a question about writer's block <laughs> in a uh, webinar about writing. Um, so we have a question from Andrew um, asking if you have ever suffer suffered from writer's block uh, and if so, uh, how did you overcome it? Um, they also say, thank you. <laughs> oh, thank you, Andrew. Appreciate the question. Um, the answer is that, uh, that yes, I have. Um, until I realized that there was no such thing as writer's block, and this was another another marketing doc, you know, a marketing concept like anxiety. They they can sell you stuff for this stuff, you know, right? Anxiety. Okay, so we have fear. It's a biological feeling that helps us not get eaten by raptors. Very useful. Okay, anxiety is having fear about fear. Useless, right? Uh, will end you up taking medication, seeing a therapist, and all kinds of other things. So. Next time you feel that way, by the way, figure out what you're frightened of and don't use the A word, just as a, a little tip there. But in this case, I figured out very quickly that I didn't have writer's block. I was a sensible, practical person, and I didn't want to write when I didn't know what I wanted to write about. So I have a couple of tricks. One of the, the one I spoke about earlier is go do some research. You know, okay, so I want to write a story about, about this sort of deadbeat uh, detective in Newfoundland. I don't know much about it. I'm going to start doing research. I'm going to start researching, you know, just the, the background to get the location stuff and what the crime level is and so on and so forth. Um, I might research, if it's not my brother, it's an imaginary character, I might research, you know, police detectives, you know, what the, there's, there are a lot of really interesting statistics about how police detectives are in different provinces, what the crimes they're dealing with, you know, is there trauma, is there a reason why he's not that functional, blah, 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 right? So I'm going to research and I guarantee you that that will get you out of writer's block. Now, if it doesn't, it's very simple. You take your favorite mystery script, okay, like Chinatown or something, uh, or um, there's, 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 a, there's a, it's called The Pledge. It's an old Jack Nicholson movie. And it's absolutely fantastic. It would be my go-to movie if I were gonna write this Newfoundland thing. It's about a broken down old guy who's just full of self-recrimination who takes on one last case. Nice, right. I'll have to watch that. <laughs> you know, it's pretty darn good if you can find it. I'm not sure it's widely available. And then I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna watch that movie 
and I'm going to, I'm going to get the script and I'm going to be typing it as I'm watching. This is the trick. I'm going to be retyping that script in cell text, of course. <laughs> uh, while I'm, while I'm, as I'm watching, I'm going to see if I can keep up and, and, and type it in format. You know, I have the other script sitting next to me. I am watching the movie and now I'm typing. I guarantee you within 10 minutes, you'll start rewriting the script. And then you'll feel something move in your head. So the two points are that these are, I've just given you several tricks to get over rush block, but the main thing is you don't know what you want to write. So you've got to do research to find out. You've got to accept that procrastination is not bad. It's just being framed properly and they're using, they, they, you've, been, you've been brainwashed into thinking it's bad. So just flip the thing. Now, the other thing, of course, is that the scripting techniques are set up to avoid this. So really, the most fast, unencumbered way is the word of the day. So you put in block and you start to free associate and you take the most interesting work and then you free associate. And that will also move you into getting going. Create those new neural pathways. Yeah, baby. <laughs> I love it. Uh, I think that's so cool. Um, I often experience writer's block, um, but I've never thought to use the, the free association as a way to uh, work around it. So, Sure. Word of the day, even if you have to do an email or something corporate, you know, it still works. I'm going to put that to the test. I have no doubt it will work, though. <laughs> And I the, will. Way, the way that you do that, uh, Nicole, is, is, is you figure, you, you know, you, you, usually when you can't, you don't want to do something, it's because it's an actual problem. And usually the problem is other people. So what you would want to do the free association for with the clusters is what's the problem? Try to put it into words. Yeah, find the problem and then, and then that'll solve how you have to do the email, that kind of thing. I love it. That's perfect. Um, Geez, I'm learning so much uh, myself. <laughs> so Great, thank I'm you. Happy to hear. <laughs> okay, I think we have time for a couple more questions. Yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pick one if I may. There's someone who wrote here. Absolutely. Uh, Andy wrote, uh, research is my favorite part, but I have trouble knowing when enough is enough. Okay, I tend to st stumble into all kinds of interesting tangents. How do you balance research with the actual drafting? Uh, the, the answer is that you have to have control. And, you know, they, there are all these things on, on, uh, on your email where you have like pocket.com where you can, you know, you can put things that you can read later. That, that's what I would do. Um, but the way that the reason that the way that, you know, you've done enough research is because the scene starts to come to you. As soon as you can start writing, you've done enough research. And as you're writing, of course, what's going to come up is the things that you don't know. But rather than stop writing, you just put them in brackets and say, you know, check on the make of the car, you know, check on, 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 the, on the size of the bullet, you know, whatever it is. But you, you do enough research so that you can write the scene. In other words, if you're trying to write a scene about when people, let's say they find a dead body and they have to, you know, figure out what happened, right? If you don't know police procedure, how can you write that scene? Of course, you're going to get writer's block and you're going to procrastinate. I mean, it's, it's common sense. I love it. And a question, really good question from a fellow Nicole. So great question, Nicole. <laughs> great. Um, okay. So uh, jumping back into um, tips and advice, um, one of our registrants, Ray, asks, um, what tips and advice would you give uh, students or like very new beginner writers on where to look for good sources, ideas, and stories on which to base their scripts? Um, that's, that's a great question. That's a great question. And, and that's, this presupposes that you'd like to write, but you don't have anything of your own that, you're, that you want to talk about. You're not, there's no family story or whatever. Um, I think that, uh, that this is a larger conversation, but the short version is, well, you know, why do you want to write a screenplay? you know, or, 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 or TV show, you know, if you don't know, if you don't have something, why do you want to do that? You just have an urge to write and that's fine. Uh, what I would do is again, I would get a notebook and I would use the scripting techniques to find out. And remember we talked about how the brain is this kind of front personality that may, is, that's the thing that maybe wants to write, but it's, it's being able to get relaxed and get into this mind space that will start to give you the answers. 
So you ask, you say, you know, the, the scripting process becomes a query, a self-inquiry. You know, what are the best stories I've ever heard? You know, but the, the word of the day always takes you to, to, to the heart because it's, it's the way in to get a word out of the part of you that is both the creative part and the wordless part. You see, that's why it's tricky. So when you start to free associate, so I'm sure that if Dara went back to the word mermaid, you know, she could remember the first time she saw the little mermaid and where she was and who she was with and what was going on with her family. And I'm sure there was enough interesting material there to provide the basis for a situation for a story. So the, the way that you if, you, if you feel an impulse to write, you have to write, but use the word of the day, cluster and make up little stories in three or four sentences. Don't worry about writing, worry about storytelling. Yeah, that's a really good insight too. I do find um, when talking to writers, um, you know, there's a lot of, I guess your brain is always on like your word count or your page count, um, you know, filling the page, making sure there's enough. Yeah. Um, but, you know, it, sometimes it is useful to, to not worry so much about that and just kind of let it flow, um, you know, to, to get you over the writer's block or to get started um, really, really wise. <laughs> well, right, you have to people, you know, people who are listening to this, who are listening to me, put on your, on your computer a little sign that says, all writing is rewriting. So you have to write something to rewrite. So it doesn't, the whole trick is to, is to get whatever's in your mind out of your head. And so the word of the day will get you there. Yeah, even the stuff that's buried in there. <laughs> Well, that's what, that's what you're trying to find because that's where the original material is. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and a follow-up question to that, we did have somebody write into the chat, um, uh, one of our attendees, Daniel. Uh, they ask, um, what is a recent screenplay you read that moved you and why? <laughs> um, well... I'm going to have trouble answering with that because I'm, I'm kind of fussy. Um, let me just think. It's a hard question. It's, 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 it, 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 I, I am more of a classicist. So, and I find that, uh, that so much of the current material is extremely derivative and that it uses traumatic backstories instead of actually trying to develop characters. So I, I have a sort of a, you know, a problem with that. I would say that, that a very good um, series that I watched recently was The Queen's Gambit. And I think that the pilot episode of that was excellent. My favorite scene is when she's brought to the orphanage and they cut her hair. You know, yeah. It does destroy her identity in one minute, right? Um, so I would say that's an excellent piece of, of, of writing. And, uh, you know, I have to say that the pilot episode of, of, uh, of Breaking Bad is just a knockout. You know, really it's great, old, but it's just really great. Yeah, and it's a bit older, but I, I honestly haven't watched a show that uh, gripped me like that <laughs> since. <laughs> But my, but my, but my favorite, my favorite show of the year, and my, and my favorite writing was really Ted Lasso, the first series of Ted Lasso <clears throat> on Apple TV, because it was, it was, it was sort of postmodern. It was, you know, they started adding in the trauma stuff towards the end of it, which was really annoying. But the first, you know, three or four episodes were great. The voices were distinctive. It moved fast. You know, the premise was interesting. Um, I did think there were a few many, too many cultural references, but okay. Um, but I thought that that was a really well, really well designed series. Very original. We talk a lot about Ted Lasso here at Celtics. <laughs> we think it's really funny. Um, it's so good. Awesome. Thank you for that insight. Um, yeah, I agree. Uh, all really great. I loved the Queen's Gambit a lot. Um, their character development was supreme. Really good. Mm. Wonderful. Um, so while we're on the topic of uh, movies, um, 
we did have a pre-submitted question about nomad land. I'm not sure if you're familiar. Um, um, uh, I'm, I'm actually not familiar with it. Okay. I'm um, sorry. I, I, meant to, I meant to go take a look at it. I don't, <clears throat> I'm not really a TV person. I watch TV for, you know, when I have to for business. That's fair. Um, really, the question is about uh, creating a script mm. that's kind of out of the box or like out of the box or, or kind of plays against all of the rules that we... This is the one, this is the one that's made from the movie with um, Francis McDormand? Yes, I believe so. Right, and, and, and she basically is displaced and, there, and, there's, and there's, there's, there's... Oh, this is... Yeah, this movie was very... Yeah, this movie was very good, actually. Yeah, I saw... I did actually see this movie. I, I, I thought... Is, is it now a series? Uh, no, it is, a, it is still a movie, I think. I don't think it, it's a series. Right um, okay, well, you know, I, I, I thought that the story was very good, but I thought that if it had been a little bit... If there had been a little bit more discipline, it would have been a heck of a lot better. Disciplined how? It, it was structurally very weak. And I don't, th I don't think that she got the bang for the buck that she would have gotten had she been willing to be a little bit more traditional. Because the whole point about the storytelling thing, I mentioned Joseph Campbell, the entire premise is that there is a universal story and we like it told in a certain way. And when it's told in a certain way, we feel satisfied. Mm. And when we don't, and I, so I saw Nomadland, I enjoyed many elements of it, but I was not satisfied. I had to go off and watch a couple of Francis Dormer. I had to go off and watch what was the Coen Brothers one that I love so much, Fargo. I had to go watch Fargo to sort of get my real taste of, you know, uh, uh, her with an arc. So I think that I'm going to say this is that I, I see people trying to do new stuff, which I appreciate, but doing sloppy, different stuff just for the sake of it is not the point. You know what I mean? In other words, you know, Shakespeare did something really new, but he didn't. He didn't. He didn't do something sloppy, and he didn't do anything just for effect. Mm -hmm. Yeah, really good point. So you know, I, I just I'm, I'm sorry. I thought it was a good film. I thought it could have been a great film. That's super fair, um, and uh, that was submitted by Ekaterina. So I hope uh, that you found that um, insightful and gave you some you know, something to think about when you're writing your screenplay. Um, absolutely, yeah, that was great. Thank you, Marilyn. I think we have uh, maybe time for one more. So I'm gonna hop down to our questions submitted during this webinar. Um, so uh, Marilyn, how would you define the relationship between psychology and script writing? I think this is a really good follow-up question to what we were just talking about. Yeah, I think it's a great question. Well, um, I, I personally have no use for psychology because it's, it's theoretical and very old-fashioned. Um, there, are, there are basic principles of human behavior, but I personally learned much more from studying cultural anthropology and working with, with psychology that is oriented to that, that is, that is oriented to you know, social psychology. I find more interesting than traditional psychology, which I think is very outdated and probably not so true anymore. So I think that, that to, as a writer, you need to be an anthropologist, even if you're writing a story about your neighborhood, right? That, they, that, that, that is an approach. But obviously uh, the relationship is that we're all trying to be happy and that what movies do, yay or nay, is they show us how to live in the same way that psychology purports to. So my grandfather, who was a movie lawyer back in the day, he represented Charlie Chaplin and Douglas Fairbanks and, and people of that era. Um, he was opposed to the Hayes Code, which was, you know, that was very restrictive. But he also said that people watch movies like it's religion. And so, you know, what you, what you share there, people are going to, are, are they're looking for solutions, so, you know, we, we, we watch stuff because we're trying to find out an answer to a question we have. And so there's a huge relationship. That's great. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, ATAC, I hope you found that, um, you know, something to chew on. Um, well, when you have writer's block, go Google social, social psychology, see what you get. <laughs> yes, I think, um, you know, everything we talked about today kind of 
writers are everything. They're sociologists, they're psychologists. Um, you know, there's lots of different roles writers play. Um, Marilyn, thank you so much for taking the time to answer all these questions uh, for us today. I'm gonna hand it back over to Dara. Um, but before I do, I would uh, thank you so much to all the participants for asking all these questions. Um, you know, whether or not you attended today, thank you for submitting your pre-submitted questions. Uh, so incredible. Um, Marilyn, I, I have a feeling that we'll be talking again uh, very yeah, so soon. Yeah, so, so you're a lot of fun. <laughs> I'm glad that you had fun. Um, and so, we did so, so try using the word of the day thing when you're having to do like a marketing thing and, and, and let me know how it works for you. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I think we could do a whole other session talking about uh, writing for marketing. <laughs> that would be <laughs> fun. Sure. That would be I like a so lot too. of that. I have, that you, that's, part of, that's part of what screenwriters have to learn. So it would be very relevant. Totally. Absolutely. I can you know, see the how connections. To sell, how, to, how to write a pitch letter, a query letter, how to do a log line. It could be very helpful. I couldn't agree more. I can't wait to talk with you again. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dara. Uh, you can take it away. Thanks, Nicole. And thank you, Marilyn. Uh, I, I don't know how much of the chat you've seen. I know it's distracting to look at it, but people I'll are open it now. really enjoying this webinar and all of your Great. insight. Um, really positive feedback throughout and we love seeing this um, this has probably been one of our most active webinars in terms of the chat that we've had and we've been doing them well almost two years now so you know wow. I'm really pleased that this has gone so well um, I'm also really excited to potentially have you back for future projects with us so sure, love everybody stay tuned um, it's interesting. Pitching is actually one of the talks we have for a future webinar later in the year. So, right. Well, I think that's, maybe that's a lot of what my that's a lot of what my my business has been is helping people go in and pitch. Right. And so also we helping people design their marketing materials. Oh, excellent! That's, that's and there's really a, there's a book on my website called How to Sell Your Screenplay in Thirty Days. If, if that's yes. of interest, I could teach from that. Happy to. I saw that. That's amazing. But so, it's a separate, but it's a separate, but you know, that's a separate, that's a separate skill. It, it absolutely is. And that's one of the reasons why our, our goal for this year is to kind of walk people through, you know, all of the separate skills you would need if you wanted to be, say, an independent producer or the skills that you're going to specialize in if you're working in the industry. So we're really hoping to get some great insight. And I think that would be amazing. Before everyone goes, Speaking of books, I did want to mention that we have a special giveaway planned for those of you who attended the webinar today. Um, so these are Marilyn's two books. Um, Daniel was so kind as to actually share the Amazon link to your how to write a screenplay. And yeah, they're, they're, you're not going to be able to, to buy them there. You'd have to go to my website. We, we right. had a little bit of an argument over the price. Where, and for those of you, uh, Dara, when you have your book of poetry, you may not want to put on Amazon because they try to deeply discount your stuff and they pocket the difference. I've heard that. Yeah. Yeah. That's so uh, you can get them on my website. They're, they're bundled up very inexpensively. If you actually let me know by email, we can arrange a special price. We'll give you five bucks off or something. But that would, that's amazing. So um, we will be giving away a copy of each of these books. Um, and that will be announced in an email that's going to come out after this webinar. And that email as well is going to be Marilyn's website, um, the information about the series that she's running, um, and a, a quick little survey for those of you who have attended to um, just get some feedback on how this webinar went and uh, how we can improve for the future because we love improving. So good luck to everyone who is an attendee. Um, like I said, that email will go out this afternoon. The recording of the webinar will go out in approximately a week. We're aiming for next Wednesday. And you can also expect to get a few resources from us. So we'll continue to send you a few emails after this webinar. If you don't want to receive them, the unsubscribe button is there at the bottom. But we're hoping that you'll be able to make use of the resources that we're going to send you that are related to this webinar. Um, before we close off, Marilyn, did you have any closing remarks or anything you'd want to share or say for our attendees? Yeah, I just also say one thing. 
it, it's, it's very important to write because that's how we understand things. And we have been through a very difficult and confusing time. The reason I started doing the webinars was to help people who weren't necessarily writers have enough confidence to actually put words to paper. So what I would encourage all of you to do is to start with you know, a really cheap notebook and a pen, invest you know, 17 minutes for a week and ask yourself the question, if I were gonna write something, what interests me? And you may find that you need to write a memoir about something that happened when you were six. And the mistake that people make is they're like, oh, okay, so that will be my, my project that I'm gonna get made into a screenplay. The answer is, it doesn't have to be. The first part of this is to understand that writing is a, is a form of self-love. Remember my whole theme here is accept yourself, find a way to be with yourself, flaws and all, understand who you are, right? So to, to have this excitement to write, even if you just keep a notebook where things come into your head and you jot them down, this is the process. That pri it's like priming a pump. You know, I think there are still pumps in the world, right? You have to, uh, you know, push them up and down for a while before there's any water pressure and you start to get flow. So everybody has stories, right? Isaac Dennis in a famous novel said, if you had a childhood, you have a novel. <laughs> So, um, you know, th there's nothing, and there's nothing too small. Um, I'll give you a very brief example. Can I take 30 seconds, Dara? Oh, yes, absolutely. Uh, so so I, I, had, I had these two friends who, who had, had a very bad marriage, and uh, they broke up, and I went and I asked my girlfriend, I said, so, you know, what was the final straw? And she held up two pairs of rubber gloves. One was yellow and one was blue. And she said, when he told me that I couldn't have yellow gloves, that I had to have another color, because he wanted to have the yellow gloves, that was it. Now, that is a, that's a throwaway. That's something that a non-writer would completely not focus on and miss. But I suspect everybody here is suffering from an awareness that they see the, the, the meanings in these things and they have no place to express them. I don't think you'd be listening to a seminar like this if you didn't. And so the first act of self-acceptance and self-love is to accept perhaps that you have a passion to do this and that no one else needs to know about it. You get yourself a notebook and, you know, um, I know, I know people who are like in the arts business and stuff and, you know, they would go right in the bathroom at four o'clock in the morning because they didn't want anybody to catch them writing, you know, too embarrassing. But the point is, you know, we've had two years of sitting in a room by ourselves. What else would we do? You know, yeah, if you're a painter, you're probably on the Bob Ross show watching, you know, how to paint a picture, which is yeah. great. But you're here. And in my experience, Dara, people find me when they're ready to go through a new doorway. That's part of my, if I have a purpose on the earth, it's to give people hope and help them self-realize in this way. So there was one question about a lady who was 51 or a guy that was 51 years old, blah, blah, blah. And the answer, here's the answer. It's never too late to be the person you were meant to be. Exactly. And, and now is the time. So no one needs to know, blah, 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 blah. But if you have this impulse, you must follow it because otherwise you are disrespecting yourself. And when you disrespect yourself, guess what happens with other people? They disrespect you. Mm -hmm. 